Okay, if you take your Bibles back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 17. Let's look at the memory verse. It says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the title of the sermon this morning is, There is Liberty. Okay, there is freedom. There is freedom as a believer. There is freedom as a Christian. Now, the world doesn't think that, right? The world thinks that if you're a church member, you're going to church, you're giving of your finances, you're, you're serving the Lord, they think you're under bondage. They think, man, are you really going to hold back your life going to church and being churchy and being a Christian? Don't you know you have freedom in this world? And yet the Bible tells us, hey, as a servant of the Lord, there is liberty, there is freedom in this life as a Christian. Okay, because you know, the, the world thinks of all the rules, they think of all the commandments. And the reason why they think it's this, this bondage is because they have the idea that salvation is by works. They think you have to live this perfect, righteous life in order to even just make it to heaven. And yet the true gospel is that salvation is a free gift. It's free. It's, it's, it's liberty. Right? And when we go out and preach the gospel door to door, we're not telling them that they need to give up on their drunkenness, though they should give up on their drunkenness. We're not telling them that they need to stop their fornication, though they should stop their fornication. There's a lot of things that they should do, but what they must do in order to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. Christianity, biblical Christianity, is freedom. It's liberty. And we're going to look at that a little bit today. Let's look at verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Now, actually, let's read... Uh, before we read that, let's just read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, so just the last verse. So quite often when, when, when I preach chapter by chapter, it's probably a good idea to just look at the last verse of the previous chapter because the, the first verse of the new chapter usually follows on on that thought. So let's look at that again. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, Paul was writing saying, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity... But as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. I'm not going to rehash what I preached there on Friday, but Paul is saying, hey, we're not preachers. I'm not a preacher, and the men that I'm sending to this church to edify you, we don't, we're not there to corrupt the Word of God. We preach in sincerity of the truth that, that, that Jesus Christ has delivered unto us. So when we have that idea, you know, it's like, well, okay, Paul is kind of defending himself. You know, we don't, we're, not, we're not the ones that are corrupting the Word of God. There are many out there that are corrupting the Word, word of God, but we are not those. So when we get to chapter, uh, verse number 1 of chapter 3, he says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? What does it mean to commend yourself? It means to, um, uh, to sort of prove yourselves, right? He's saying, hey, do I need to prove myself to you? Do I need to tell you? Do I really need to tell you that I don't corrupt the Word of God? And, and, and Apollos and the other men, Titus and Timothy, these other men that have gone to, to see you, um, do I need to prove? Do I really need to prove that to you? Do I need to commend ourselves to you? Uh, or need we as others, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of condemnation, condemnation from you? Do I really need to bring a letter from some Bible college, do I really need to bring a letter from some IFB Pope to prove to you that I'm, I'm, I'm credible? You know, he says, no, you know, because I'm, I'm your apostle, you know, because I'm the one that got this church started. I don't need to prove myself with anything else but the work that I've done in this church. Okay? So Paul doesn't need to defend himself. Okay? But quite often, a lot of preachers, and I, look, I don't like bagging out other preachers, okay? Because they don't mean, you know, like, they don't mean to, to do things wrongly or anything like that. Honestly, they just sort of uh, copy the same things that have been done over and over again. But quite often, preachers would like to say, well, you know, I've got the stamp of approval of this Pope. I've got the stamp of approval of this Bible college. I've got the stamp of approval of all these other pastors around me. So you know I'm the real deal, you know, and a lot of missionaries, a lot of missionaries do this. They, they call churches and say, hey, can I come and preach to your church? And the reason they want to do that is because they want the support, either support in prayer or support financially for them to do their, to their, to do their work. And quite often missionaries will come. Hey, this church supports me. This church supports me. This church. You know, I come with all this commendation. commendation. But really, what should be proving you is the work that you do. Not what other people have to say about you. Okay? The work that you do. Let's look at verse number two. 
So what is this letter of commendation? In, in what way does Paul prove himself to this church? Verse number two. Ye, the people in this church, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, know and read of all men. So it says, you, church in Corinth, you are my commendation. You are my epistle. You are my recommendation. Okay? You know, I've been there. I got this church started. I got a number of you people saved. I'm the one that's writing these epistles to you to edify you and to help you. I don't need anything else but the proof that's in this church. Okay? And uh, again, keep, keep in mind that there were people in this church that were critical of Paul. You know, they were critical of Paul. Now, when we think about this church, obviously, you, you know, it's the, the kind of idea is, really, Paul, do you really want this church to be your commendation? Because they've had so many problems. <laughs> Doesn't this reflect badly on your apostleship? But keep in mind that Paul wasn't there every, you know, week in, week out with the church, right? He was there for the first year and a half, getting people saved, setting his church up, and then he was there sending, sending uh, leaders to go and preach. He was there writing letters, not just First and Second Corinthians, but he had written other letters to, to the church. So he was there trying to teach them and edify them. And yet, even though this church had a lot of problems, but because it was, on its, its, um, it, it was improving, it had implemented a lot of the things that had, uh, Paul had criticized them, Paul was happy to view the church as his commendation. And he says, not just to the church itself, but known and read of all men. So any man outside in the community of other churches could look at this current church and say, hey, this proves that Paul is not someone that corrupts the word of God. This proves, look at this church, look how they're growing. You know, either, either numerically or in maturity, they were growing in the Lord, they were growing in knowledge, and this proved the apostleship of Paul. Now, when we think about this church, you know, the, the Corinth church, um, so if, we, if you remember from, from 1 Corinthians, Paul had been there for a year and a half, right? In Corinth, teaching, uh, getting people saved, starting this church up. Now, it's estimated that the, first, the letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, so after Paul left, it's about a year later after he left, or maybe more, that he wrote 1 Corinthians. And it's estimated again that it could be another year or two years later that he wrote 2 Corinthians, okay? So when you think about the, the, the commencement of that church, to where we are now in this letter, there's a, there's a minimum of three years, maybe four or five years, that this church has been operating. Okay? And Paul looks at the church and says, you, you are my proof of my work. You are proof of, of, of you know, you're, you're my letter or epistle of commendation. And, you know, what about you, Kevin? What's, what's your proof? Well, there's not a lot yet. <laughs> All right? We've been operating for just over eight months as a church. You know, none of my converts out soul winning are here in this church. Well, except for my wife and kids, I guess. You could, you could count that, right? Uh, but, you know, I would hope that in three, four, five years' time that I could look at this church and if someone says, Kevin, can you prove to us that, you know, you're doing the Lord's work? I'd be like, you know, can, can, you, can you recommend some well-known pastor that can recommend your church or anything like that? I'll be like, hey, just come and visit our church. Just come and, vi and talk to the people in our church. Just come and look at the work that we're doing for him, you know. Whether we've grown numerically or whether we've just grown spiritually, I would like, you know, New Life Baptist Church to be my epistle of commendation, right? I mean, that's what it should be like. You know, if you've been in a church that's been there for, you know, three years, four years, five years, and you look at the church and it's falling apart, there's divisions in the church, there's problems everywhere, the sin, sin is abounding, that's going to reflect badly on that preacher. Okay, if that church is falling apart, it's going to reflect badly, and that's going to show that this person is not preaching out of the sincerity of their heart. Okay, there are major problems with the leader in that church. Okay, and yes, there were problems in this church, but yet there was this improvement, they were growing, they were, they were fixing things, and Paul was able to look at them and say, yep, your proof, you know, of my work, okay? I don't need any other proof. I would like that to be the case in three, four, five years, once we've established ourselves a bit d deeper here in the community. Hopefully there are people that, you know, get saved, that are, well, we know people are getting saved, but are actually coming into this church, getting baptized, growing in the Lord, etc., etc. That would be a wonderful thing. And let me just say this. In the eight months that I've been here, you know, it hasn't been that long, but I can assure you, I've seen growth. Okay, maybe not numerically, but I've definitely seen growth spiritually. 
definitely. I have no doubt about that. I don't know if you, if you guys feel, about, feel that yourselves, uh, but even just growth in, uh, as a, a united church, having one mind, having one purpose, and working together. And so I, I'm, I'm glad I, I can look at this church and say, hey, you know, we are growing together as a church. We are growing spiritually. We have a greater love for the brethren. We have a greater love for the Word of God. We have a greater love for God Himself. And I'm happy with that, okay? And that's what a pastor should be, okay? It shouldn't be about who recommends me. It shouldn't be about the books that I've written. It shouldn't be about my public profile. It should be, no, the proof is in the pudding. We look at the church and say, hey, is this a man of God? Is this a man that's been sent of God? You know, what's the proof of his ministry? It's the church, okay? Let's go to verse number three. Verse number three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So, you know, I don't, let me, let me just say this quickly. I don't endeavor to be this social media, you know, uh, pro, have this, this, this uh, large social media profile. You know, I don't endeavor to, to write all these books. You know how a lot of pastors have all these books and it's like, wow, look at him. L look at the legacy that he's left. All these books written in ink. No, the legacy we want to leave is the spirit of the living God moving in the church. Okay, moving in the church. I don't need to be recognized 50 years from now if I, if I passed away by then. You know, I don't care. What I care about is have the people of God, the people that God has entrusted me under, have they grown spiritually? That's what matters, okay? But with the spirit of the living God, and then he says this, not in tables of stone. So now Paul starts to change the topic a little bit here. He's talking about these tables of stone, which, is a, which are the Ten Commandments. If you remember, uh, Moses went up to Mount Sinai. He was up there with the Lord for, a, was it 40 days? I think it was, 40 days. He came back down with these tables of stone, with the Ten Commandments written on that. And, uh, and Paul is saying, hey, you, the church is even more important to me than those Ten Commandments, those tables of stones that's, that Moses got from Mount Sinai. Okay, verse number four. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. So when he says, and such trust have we through Christ, he's saying here, I have confidence in you, church. Yes, you know, you've had major problems. Yes, I've had to rebuke you. Yes, I've had to criticize you. Yes, you still have problems. Yes, you're still sorrowful for the things you've done. But I trust, I have confidence that in Christ, you're going to continue serving the Lord. Okay? Because the Spirit of God is moving in the church. And that's what we want. We want the Holy Spirit in your hearts, moving in your hearts, okay? We talk about this, you know, being born of the Spirit, the work we do going door to door, soul winning. That is so important, okay? Being born of the Spirit. But there is a, there's a movement of the Spirit that should be amongst the church itself. When we come here, we want the Holy Spirit to take the words of God and move your heart and move my heart so that we can grow in maturity. And, and Paul says, hey, I have such trust. I have confidence, and, and that's the truth. I've got to take that promise and say, hey, as long as we preach the Word of God with sincerity, without corrupting the Word of God, then I have confidence that the Holy Spirit will move in your life and, and help you to grow in, in maturity to the Lord, to serve Him in a more powerful way so that God will be more real in your life, that you will know the Word of God better. And that way when the Lord comes in His second coming, He can say to hopefully all of us, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want. I want us to pre pre present it as this chaste virgin, you know, to, to, to Christ when he comes back. That's, that's what I would love in this church. Verse number five. So the, the thought here is, you know, well, Paul's just finished saying, hey, you're my proof. I've done a lot of work with you. You guys are growing. It might sound a little prideful, okay? And I always love that. I always love how when Paul says things like that, he always comes back with humility. And this is what we see in verse number five. He says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. So he goes, by the way, you know, yes, I've done a lot of work. You know, you're my proof, but I don't think of myself anything more than I should. Okay? But then he says, but our sufficiency is of God. So a growing church, numerically or spiritually or both, are not testaments of that minister to boast in his pride. Okay? It shouldn't be that the, 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 the pastor says, hey, you know, look at all the work that I've done. Look at all that I've achieved. You know, while there's some truth of that, that sufficiency, that ability came by God. 
And so it's God that should be given the honor and glory of this church even existing. It's God that should be given the glory and the honor if we grow in maturity because it's Him that gave us the words. Okay? And that's why, again, it's so important that when we preach, we preach God's words. You know, again, if I just preach my wisdom, my experience, yeah, you might grow a little bit, you might be edified a little bit, but that's just man. <laughs> right? You're going to get the, the good things out of me, you're going to get the bad things out of me. You're going to reflect even the, the bad parts of me because it's, it's out of the flesh. But we preach the Word of God. We know these, these words are spiritual. They're going to edify you. And if you grow, if you see some truth of nugget, hey, it's not Kevin. It's, it's God that has used Kevin. It's God that needs the glory and the honor and the praise of man. It's, it's not our Paul himself. I love his humility. I always love how he comes back and, and points back to God. It's not about me. It's about God. Okay? A humble attitude of, you know, the Lord has used us versus look what I have achieved. Okay? Verse number six. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. So there it goes again. God has made, gave, given me the ability. He has made me able, the able minister of the New Testament. You know, whatever ability you have, the ability to preach, the ability to serve, the ability to, to get people saved, it has come from God. Okay? And then it says, not of the letter... Now, what he means by the letter, when he says that, is the Old Testament law. Okay? It's not by the Old Testament law, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So, you've got to just remember, this, this has been written in Paul's day. Is there anything wrong with the Old Testament laws? Of course not. The Old Testament laws reflect to us the righteousness of God. It teaches us what is sinful. It helps us so we don't harm ourselves you know, in sin or, or damage ourselves. We can grow and learn and understand the mind of God and so that we can come to, to the Lord and understand, hey, we're a sinner. We come short of God's glory. God expects perfection. I can't reach that. Therefore, I need Jesus to save me. The law is good. The law has a purpose. But the law can kill as well. Why? Because the Jews in the time of Paul, and even the Jews today, are thinking they can be saved or be righteous before God if they keep the law. And yet it's the law that's killing them, spiritually, if you want to look at it that way, because they can't reach, they can't keep the laws. They can't keep all the commandments. And this is not just the Jews. This is every false religion. What are they saying? What do they think they need to do to go to heaven? They think it's my works. They think I have to be a good person. They think I have to go to church. They think I have to be baptized. They think I need to clean up my life and turn from all my sins to be saved. No, it's none of those things. You're not going, if that's what you think is going, is going to get you to heaven, well, that's what's going to kill you, okay? It's not trust in the law, the ability to keep the law that gets you saved. It's the movement of the Spirit. It's being born of the Spirit. Okay, so it's a letter that kills, but it's a spirit that gives life. Now, one thing that I did want to just bring up here, just, just to sharpen our, our soul winning a little bit. Have you ever been asked the question, e either just door to door, or just by a friend, like friend, once you give them the gospel and you say, hey, it's just by grace through faith, it's not of works. A, a lot of the times the question comes, um, what's the question? So are you saying we can be saved and live however we want? Now think about that. Can we be saved and live however we want? Now, this is a bit of a trick question, okay? I'm just saying this on purpose. But let me ask the question again. Can we be saved and live however we want? If, if you think yes, can I see a show of hands? You're not in trouble if you get this wrong. All right, put your hand down. If you think no, can I see a show of hands? Okay, cool. All right, put them down. Uh, you're both right and you're both wrong, <laughs> okay? It, 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 it always comes down to what are you asking, right? And this is the thing that I keep re repeating, repeating to you guys. Don't react to just a phrase or a word. What do you mean is the question, right? Because if you pull out a dictionary and look up the word can, you know, can we live however we want, can, it has two definitions, right? Can is, um, uh, what, did I write this down? Yeah. Can can mean the ability, Right? Do we, do we have the ability to do something? You know, um, like for example, my wife might say, Kevin, can you open this can of, of whatever for cooking? She can't open it. 
Yeah, I have the ability to do that, right? I have the ability. But can has a second definition, which is uh, permission. You know, is it like my children might say, you know, Dad, can we, can we play outside? Well, you can if it's about the ability. Yeah, you can walk outside and play, but if you're asking for permission, well, it might be no, because you might finish, need to finish your schoolwork before you go and play. So it, it all depends what that person means by can. You know, now, first of all, let's put it this way. Are we talking about the ability? You know, can we live however we want and be saved? Do we have the ability, ability to do that? Of course. Of course you can live however you want and be saved. Of course. Because you have the ability to do all kinds of sins. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can do what's good. You can do what's bad. Because salvation is not based on your performance. It's not based on how good you are. It's not based on how bad you are. And so, yeah, I guess the answer is yes. You can do, you can live however you want and still be saved. But we're talking about ability there, okay? Now, but it, are you permitted? Can we, like, does God permit us to live however we want? Well, no, okay? God wants us to keep the commandments. God expects us to try to live after his word and improve ourselves, overcome sin, be more holy, then no, you can't live however you want. You know, God doesn't just give us this free reign to do whatever we want because he's going to come down with his hand of chastisement and if you're a son of God, he's going to correct you and put you through some hard times so you can learn to get past some sins and grow in your life. So you can see how when someone asks that question, don't give them a one-word answer, yes or no. Answer both, the ability and is it permissible. Okay, you need to. Otherwise, you know, people are going to be left thinking, like if you say, yes, you can live however you want, they're going to be left thinking, what, so God doesn't care with how you live your life? Of course he does. And he's not going to come down with his hand of chastisement. Of course he will. But then if you think, well, yes, you can live, uh, no, you can't live however you want, be thinking of permission, they're going to think, oh, okay, so I've got to work my way to heaven. So you've got to make sure you answer that question with both those answers, with both those definitions of can. Okay. Now, let's look at verse number 7. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, sorry, chapter 2. What are we up to? 3, sorry, 3, verse 7. Uh, but if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. So here, you know, the Old Testament laws, you know, Paul is saying, even though they, were, they bring death, they kill, but they're glorious. It is. It is glorious. And I, I hate how Christians look at the Old Testament and think, oh, God doesn't want us, you know, God doesn't, that, that, that's not important anymore. It's just the New Testament that's important. No, even the commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments, things that were engraven in stone, the law of Moses back then, it's still glorious. There's still a lot of great things you can learn from there, okay? It's glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. So here Paul is illustrating, I don't know if you remember the story, Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai, got in the commandments, but when he came down, his face shone so brightly because he was in the presence of God. And his face was so bright that the children of Israel couldn't, couldn't see. He had to put a veil over his face. You know, it blinded, blinded their eyes. They couldn't take the, 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 the shining of Moses' face. And so the Old Testament is, is pictured in that sense. The glory that was shining off Moses' face is like the glory of the Old Testament. It's valuable. Read it. Don't skip it. Don't just be a Christian, just, just read the New Testament. Read the Old Testament. Read the, there's, there's glory to be found in there. Okay? Uh, and then, uh, I don't know if I can finish reading it, but verse 7 says, which glory was to be done away. So even though the Old Testament was glorious... It was, the purpose was that it would be done away with. The New Testament would come into play. Okay? The New Testament would come into play with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Verse number 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Okay, so even though the Old Testament, the laws of Moses were glorious, how much more is what he's saying should now in the New Testament, the working of the Spirit within the local New Testament church is, should be even more glorious. You know, and we might be thinking something like this, like, 
It would have been such a great thing if we were in Old Testament Israel, we had seen all these miracles, we had seen you know, uh, you know, the thundering and the lightnings and the voice of God on Mount Sinai, we had seen Moses with that face that shining, man, that would have been so glorious. But Paul is saying now in the New Testament, it's even more glorious. Okay, So what we have today is even better than what the Jews had or the Israelites had in the Old Testament. Verse number 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. Verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. So the glory that we have today is the ministry of reconciliation. It's the preaching of the gospel. It's getting people saved. Okay? So just look at verse number 9 again. Much more doth the ministri ministration, that's a ministry of righteousness exceeding glory. What righteousness are we preaching? You know, when we go door to door, we win soul, see souls saved. Are we seeking their own self-righteousness? Are we seeking for them to, have, to turn from the, all their sins and have this righteous living and that's what we're preaching? No. We're preaching the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're preaching the righteousness of the New Testament. They can have the full righteousness of Christ right now if they believe on Him, if they're born of the Spirit. That's why it exceeds in glory. Because no matter how much, I mean, you could be the best Christian, you could keep the Old Testament laws, you could be the one that keeps it the best. And yeah, there'll be glory in that, okay? If you keep the commandments, there's glory in that. But it, what exceeds that glory is the glory of Jesus Christ. Don't forget, He didn't just come to die on the cross for our sins. He came to keep the Old Testament law perfectly. He was a spotless Lamb of God. He never committed any sins. And his life was full of righteousness. And when you believe on him, that righteousness is imputed upon you. When God looks at you, he sees you perfect and righteous. This is why the New Testament is so much better than the Old Testament. Yeah, the righteousness of Christ is on show, is on display. Yes, you know, we've already preached about the old man. We have the old flesh, and there's no righteousness in that flesh. Okay? But that new man, that inner man, that, that remains sinless, has the righteousness of Christ. That's the righteousness, that, that, that this ministration, this ministry of reconciliation that we have in this New Testament. Let's look at verse 11. For if that which is done away, the Old Testament, the Old Testament laws, was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Okay, so again, you know, this is, by the way, people talk about replacement theology, like it's a bad thing. This is the true replacement theology that the Old Testament has been done away with and has been replaced by the New Testament. Okay? The Old Testament has been done away with. We have a much more glorious um, uh, uh, New Testament. Keep your finger there. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And I feel like this topic needs a sermon all by itself. And one day I will preach a whole sermon on the changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I think that would be a great topic to preach on. But let's just get some, some thoughts right now. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8. Because the question is, well, what's been done away with in the Old Testament? Is everything done away? Because if everything is done away with in the Old Testament, then in reality, we don't even need the Old Testament. Like if everything's been done away with. But there are still things that we can read there. You know, all Scripture is given um, uh, by... Uh, how's it go again? I've lost it. By inspiration. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable, okay? For doctrine, for, for reproof. I can't even memorize it right now. Huh? Correction. Anyone else got it? And there was something else I think, wasn't it? I had it memorized and I can't, take it. I can't remember it right now. Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about. All Scripture is profitable for us, okay? And so if we look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, let's have a look at this quickly. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. The Bible gives us a sort of this idea of what's been done away with in the Old Testament. It says in verse number 8, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The first tabernacle is where they would sacrifice, you know, the animals 
before they built the temple. And so the old tabernacle represents the Old Testament. It represents the laws of Moses. Verse number 9. Which was a figure for the time then present. So why was, why was it necessary to sacrifice these animals on the altar of the tabernacle? Was it because the blood of animals washed away our sins? You know, was it something? No, it says it was just a figure. It was a shadow. It was something that would point us to ultimately Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice of God. It was something to remind the Old Testament saints, hey, we have a Messiah coming that's going to sacrifice himself. You know, it's a figure in which, verse number nine, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So you can see that even if you did all the Old Testament laws, all the sacrifices, that practice in of itself did not make anyone perfect. It did not make you righteous before God. Okay? So these are some things, you know, it's starting to give us these ideas of what's been done away with. All these Old Testament practices of sacrifice, of tabernacle, of the shedding of blood of animals and things like that. Uh, verse number 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Now that time of Reformation, you know, a lot of Christians talk about the Reformation period and they're talking about the Protestant movement in Europe. That's not what the Bible talks about when it talks about, you know, Reformation. It's talking about the coming of Christ. It's coming, it's talking about the, um, you know, Christ bringing in the New Testament through his sacrifice. So the things they would practice in the old, te um, the, the tabernacle or in the uh, temple, the, you know, the certain drinks that they eat, you know, the things that they could eat and could not eat, the washings, how they had to wash before they could serve in the temple, the carnal ordinances, all of this would be done away with when the New Testament would come into play. Verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So how do we get eternal redemption? The blood of goats and calves? No, by his own blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you'll see soon it's not just for us, but even for the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints were saved by the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ even though yet in our history it had not taken place. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? Yes, it happened 2,000 years ago for us, but His shedding of blood, the salvation was offered from the beginning of time. From Adam and Eve, His salvation was always offered, and it was always available through the blood of Christ, not the blood of goats and calves. We'll see this soon. Uh, uh, verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, heifer, that, that's uh, like a, a type of cow, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And by the way, People that are trying to get to heaven by their works, by their righteousness, the Bible calls that dead works. Is it works? Yes, it is. is it, could it be profitable to some people um, on this earth? Yes, there's some profit to it. But as far as obtaining salvation, you know, works without faith, the Bible calls it dead works. It plays no part in you being righteous before God. And verse 15, for, uh, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. And by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which accord might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. See, verse 15 confirms to us that Christ's death, Christ's shedding of, of his blood, applied to those that were under the First Testament, those that were under the Old Testament, those that were under the, 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 um, uh, the law of Moses, that their salvation was still by grace through faith in the shedding of Christ's blood. They had pictures of it in the Old Testament. Today in the New Testament, we can look back and see the fulfillment of all these things. We have that very clear to us through the Scriptures, but the Old Testament saints kind of looked at it through a glass darkly, but they could see by the pictures that God had instilled in their nation that there would be this ultimate sacrifice, and it's their faith upon that that got them saved. It was the faith of, on the blood of Jesus Christ. 
even in the Old Testament, even if they didn't know the name of Christ in the Old Testament, it's, it was still the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the, of, of the world that, that, um, that they were saved by, not by the shedding of blood. Not, sorry, not by the shedding of blood of animals, I should say. Okay, uh, verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So I just read that because when Christ died, that's when the Old Testament was done away with, and when, he went, uh, when his blood was shed, the New Testament was in effect. The New Testament was in effect. Salvation, uh, uh, which was you know, um, uh, revealed to us by the name of Christ, in, in the Son of God that would uh, die on the cross, be buried for three days and three nights, and rise again from the dead. So just in summary of, of what we've seen there, we've seen that the Old Testament has been done away with, we see that even in the Old Testament times, the blood of goats never saved anybody. It was always by Jesus Christ. But what a lot of people do is they break down the Old Testament in three different ways. And I think they're probably the best ways to break it down. They break it down as ceremonial laws, um, moral laws, and civil laws. Okay? Ceremonial laws, moral laws, and civil laws. And by ceremonial laws, it's pretty much what we just read there. The washings the sacrifices, the things that were practiced in the Old Testament. But even things as far as, you know, circumcision, you know, keeping the Sabbath, uh, these kind of things that were just figures or types of Christ, they don't need to be observed anymore because we have the true Sabbath in Christ. We have the true sacrifice in Christ. Okay? We have the true Lamb that, in Christ that, that shed His blood for us. So all those Old Testament practices which fall under those ceremonial laws that pictured Christ have been done away with. We don't need to keep those things anymore. That's been done away with. Okay? But then we talk about moral laws. We talk about knowing what's right and wrong. Knowing what's sinful. Knowing how God feels about a certain sin. The moral laws. Those things are still applicable today. A lot, all those things. In fact, the New Testament repeats those things over and over again just to reinforce to us, hey, we do need to keep the commandments. Hey, we should love the Lord God with all our heart, mind and soul. We should love our neighbours. We should, you know, uh, 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 seek to overcome these sins in our lives. Even though that's not what saves us, that's not what saved the Old Testament saints, it's not what's going to save the New Testament saints, right? It's always the blood of Jesus Christ. But those moral laws are still there, so we understand how, how can we live a holy life that pleases the Lord and not, not damage ourselves upon this world. Hey, how can we earn you know, great rewards in heaven you know, by, by trying to please the Lord and serve Him? And um, So those moral laws are still in effect. What's right and what's wrong? What was sinful in the Old Testament is still sinful in the New Testament. You know, uh, homosexuality, that was sinful in the Old Testament. Guess what? It's still sinful today. It doesn't matter if our nation accepts it. It's still sinful. It's still an abomination to God. Okay? So the things that were sins in the Old Testament are still sins today. The third category are the civil laws. The civil laws, these are basically how nation ought to operate um, as, a, as a government. Okay? It's not just dealing with sins but it's identifying what sins are crimes, okay? What sins are crimes and where the, where the government needs to step in and, 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 and uh, you know, um, and, and judge righteously, okay? Are those things into effect? Well, kind of yes and no, okay? God did not ask for Australia to keep, you know, the Old Testament laws, if you will, the government of Australia and, and to bring in the, the laws and, and, and how... You know, crime ought to be punished. You know, because what, what happened in, in the Old Testament days, when God would have had a, that expectation of Israel, He would either bless or curse them. If Israel was not carrying out the laws of God, if they were not punishing crime the way He had instructed them, He would curse them. He would rise a nation and destroy them. He would take them out of the land and into bondage if they weren't following the things of God. But when they did turn their hearts back to God, when they did seek to serve Him and keep all His laws, the Lord will bring them back into the land and bless them richly. Okay? I do not personally believe that every nation today under the New Testament laws has this same expectation of blessings and cursings that God had on Israel. So in that sense, no. But in another sense, should we have these civil laws in our nation? Yes. Why? Because it's based on the righteousness of God. Are you going to tell me that the Prime Minister of Australia and our Senators and the lawmakers are more righteous than God Himself? Are you going to tell me that these men are more just than, than God Himself? Of course not. 
Okay? And so if God says, hey, this is how we ought to punish this crime in the Old Testament, I do believe that our nation should be, have the Bible as their authority and say, wow, this is how God feels about this crime, about this sin. We should implement that same punishment in our nation. I do believe that. And I do believe these things ought to be preached by the churches and hopefully God will turn the hearts of the politicians and they would bring in laws that would be aligned with the laws of God. But do I believe that God is going to necessarily bless and curse a nation because of this? No. But some of these things have inbuilt cursings and blessings. The more we get away from the laws of God, the more our nation is going to be cursed by not obeying His laws. And, and you know... The more our nation tries to emulate the, the laws that are by God, by default, there's going to be greater blessings because there's going to be less sin, there's going to be less crime. You know, um, that's how I feel about that. I don't, you might have some other thoughts. Let me know if you do. But yes, I do believe the civil laws are important. I do believe they need to be preached, and I believe our nation should strive to to um, have the same judgment of uh, of and righteousness that the Lord God has. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 12. <clears throat> Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. You know, the hope of the movement of the Spirit, you know, getting people saved, the church growing, these kind of things. I love how he says we use plainness, plainness of speech. You know, I aim very hard when I preach to you guys. I try my best to be plain, as plain as, per, as, as possible, meaning that it's understandable. So I don't leave you with a lot of questions. You know, hopefully I answer more questions than generate questions. Hopefully when I preach, it's not confusing. Hopefully you understand what's being said, you know, using plainness of speech. I don't try to talk at a level that's very high, nor do I try to talk at a level that's very basic, but somewhere in the middle that hopefully the majority of, of people in this church can understand my preaching. Because I want to emulate the way Paul is. Paul had great success, and he did it by plainness of speech. And if you know, you're a preacher, then you want to try to emulate these things as well. Preach plainly. Make it clear. Make it simple. Make it you know, easy to understand. And don't preach that in a way that makes confusion. I mean, if you preach something and you find everyone's confused and everyone's not, showing, not knowing what you're saying... You haven't preached a good sermon. You know, that's an area that you need to fix in your life. Verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. So again, he's using this illustration of, of, of the veil of Moses, something that was hit, his face was hidden because it shone so brightly. You know, we, we don't want to preach in that same way that we're trying to hide what we truly believe. You know, no, I, I want to tell you what I truly believe. I want to be able to preach openly and tell you those things. Uh, and then he says, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So the veil on Moses' face is like a type of the Old Testament. Okay, a type of the Old Testament. It had glory, but there would come a time where a veil would need to cover it. Okay, um, and then when the New Testament, the New Testament would come and abolish or end that Old Testament. It's like that veil would be removed once again, okay? And then look, let's look at verse 14. But their minds, talking about the non-believing Israelites, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away, so is done away in Christ. So it's Christ, it's the New Testament that removes that veil. But yet these unbelieving Israelites, they're still, it's like they're still, that, that veil is still over the face of Moses, if you will. Because, you know, they're so focused on the Old Testament, they're trying to be saved by keeping the laws rather than recognizing that Christ is their only way, their only way of salvation. Okay? Now, you know, I'm going to try to explain this a little bit, but it, it's Christ who is the one that removes that veil, spiritually speaking, okay? Because the Old Testament is so glorious that a man striving to keep those laws will never meet that glory. That's why the Bible says, for, you know, um, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't meet God's glory. That's why it's, it's kind of better that a veil is over, over that because we, we realize we can't achieve that 
But in Christ, we can remove that veil and, and have that full glory because it's not our glory. Remember, salvation is not our glory, but the glory of Christ. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness is imputed upon you. His glory is imputed upon you. So we can face that glory because we know that that new man in us is sinless and perfect. Okay? Uh, verse 15. But even unto this day, so even unto the day that Paul had written this letter, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. They still don't know. It's still hidden. The glory of God is still hidden because they reject Jesus Christ. But this doesn't just apply to the Jews then. It, apply, it, it applies to Judaism today. They still have this veil over, this, over their heart because they continue rejecting Christ. But again, as I said, it's not just Judaism. It's every false religion. Every false religion has this veil over them. They don't see the reality, the glory of God in Christ. If they keep rejecting Christ and His sacrifice, they will always have this veil. They will never have, be able to have the glory of God on display. But it's only available in Christ. Verse 16. Nevertheless, and this is our goal, by the way, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, what? Their heart. When their heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So when we go and we preach the gospel, we tell people about the beautiful sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're aiming for their hearts to turn to the Lord. We're aiming that they would believe with all their hearts on the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And when they do that, that veil is taken away. They now can see that glory. They can be in that glory because that glory is, in, is of Christ. Verse 17. Verse 17. Now, keep in mind everything that we've been saying so far about the Old Testament and how you know, people striving to keep those commands can never be saved. Okay? Verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So when you turn your heart to God, you believe with all your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, without the works of the law, the Bible says this is liberty, this is freedom. I mean, think about, I don't know, I got saved at a very early age, so I can't really relate to this. But a lot of you got saved later in life. And you may th think about the time where you just weren't sure. Like, am I going to heaven? Have I done enough? You know, have I lost my salvation? You know, am, am I good enough? I mean, think about the, the grief that brings upon your life. Think about the stress that has on you. And there's been numerous times when I've been able to get somebody saved at the door, and there's just this huge relief. Oh, thank God for telling me this. I didn't know. I thought I had to be good enough. And I wasn't sure. But now I'm 100% sure that I'm going to heaven. And it, it gives me such joy sometimes when I see tears in their eyes because I can see that stress and that burden has fallen off their shoulders. It's, oh, I realize now it's just a free gift. It's all in Christ. And there's a freedom. You know, the chains have come off their hands and the chains have come off their feet. They believed on Christ. They're free now. They know they can go to heaven. That stress is no longer on their mind. And now because they're free, they can, they can serve the Lord in that freedom that God has given us. You know, God doesn't put a gun to your head and say, hey, keep all my commandments. Now you can if you want, and there's great blessings, there's great rewards should you keep his commandments after salvation. Okay, great rewards in heaven. But there's no um, uh, gun pointed to your head. You can, you can, ability-wise, live however you want you know you can do that if you want that's freedom because salvation is not based on your performance but based on your faith on christ alone okay so there is that liberty if you will okay but the liberty truly comes in christ because let, let's let it's free gift okay no amount of works that you do no much how much no matter no much how much damage you want to pay or try to be live righteously that's not going to get you saved. The free gift of salvation is available to everybody who would believe, and that's where the liberty is. Verse 18. But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's kind of that, that glory in the Old Testament of Moses' face that couldn't be seen by, you know, they had to cover his face. It was so bright and shining. Which is when you're saved, when that veil's taken off your heart, you can be in that glory. You can, in a glass, in that mirror, you can see the glory of God 
And it, you can shine in the same way, not physically. Okay, that's just a picture. Moses' face, face shining. Uh, it's not a physical shining, but within there is. Within that new man shines brightly. Within that new man has the glory of God. Okay, and I want to see this church grow. I want to see that new man shine brightly. I want to see that old man get diminished in our lives, not just in my life, but in all our lives. And as we continue to serve the Lord, we meet week in, week out. I want to see that new man in you shine gloriously as we continue to learn the Word of God. Let's pray.